Okay, so I'm I'm leading this, but just because I volunteered. So um, <laughs> the, the the people sitting up here were part of our workshop. Oh, thanks on um, on a prosody that we had on Wednesday, and we we had been in discussion about what we wanted the goals of it to be for you know about a year or so. I'm sorry, I don't know why this is tweaking like that. Um, so. So this is sort of the, the over, overarching goals of the workshop that we sort of agreed upon in our prior discussions. What? Okay, thank you. So um, first of all, to develop a network of researchers working on or with interest in AAE prosody. Um, secondly, to better understand the prosodic structure of AAE and how the structure can inform our larger models of intonation and prosody. Third, to explore how our current linguistic knowledge, right, in either that be syntactic, semantic, morphological, pragmatic, etc., of AAE can inform our understanding of AAE prosody. Um, fourth, to discuss challenges in working on AAE prosody and, you know, to try to solve those challenges, work around them, work with them. Um, and then finally, to develop some shared resources, uh, corpora, training materials, Keep on <laughs> tutorials, <laughs> et cetera, for investigating AE prosody. Um, so these are, you know, some lofty goals. We didn't, we didn't get to all of these, right? But, um, but I think we had some really good discussions and presentations that help us make steps toward this. And, and um, so first of all, I think we've, We've, we've made some steps toward developing a network. So um, these were the speakers who we invited to be a part of it. So Elena Brugos, uh, Shalom. Oh, thank you guys for sitting in order. <laughs> Lisa Green, Nicole Holliday, Sonja Lane Hart. She had to leave, unfortunately, um, and Jason McClarty. And um, so you can see uh, everyone's presentations, um, the most of the slides are shared on our OSF um, framework, or yeah, on our OSF page, um, and more things will be shared there. And we would also like to invite anyone who would like to be part of continuing discussions around this to join um, the ETAP AAE list, which you can see there, and you can also access it through through the page, because um, this will be, we're excited, we're gonna continue um, these discussions, right? So goal one, develop some network. Right? I think we made some steps on that. And thanks to also people who came and participated um, on Wednesday. Right, so secondly, understanding the prosodic structure of AAE. <clears throat> I think we agree this is going to take some time. So there's been some discussion of some initial findings. Um, we heard about some things from Nicole and Jason and from other talks um, about what sorts of phonological and or phonetic differences we might see. You know between AAE and MAE. Um, Nicole talked about some work um, with, you know, within AAE and uh, looking at, um, you know, Rachel Burdine has work, right, looking at um, Jewish uh, English. And so, so we're, we can, we have some ideas about what some of these differences might be, but certainly it's clear that there's a lot of work still to be done, right? And, um, and so a lot of the discussion or some of the discussion that we had was about what tools are we going to use? And I think I think Pilar's talk was really informative about how we need to be looking at this from lots of levels. And so um, part, some of the talks on Wednesday were sort of introduction to various methods that we might use. And so with this understanding that you know it would be great to use Toby, but an understanding that you know MAE Toby as it stands might not have all the categories that we might want. And so we might then want to use something more like uh, an IPRA, how do we how do we call it? an IPRA or something more like a a Q-based prosodic analysis? Um, we talked about using RPT, right, uh, or even a very low-level acoustic analysis um, to maybe it, use all of these all of these methods, perhaps in tandem, to both propose questions and develop hypotheses about what some of the structures might be. Um, anyone else have thoughts on that? <coughs> But we got some great uh, examples of methods that have been used, and so I think there's a lot of excitement about how those can be applied. Um, do you want to take comments from the audience? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> can someone write these down? Oh, okay. Um, 
to make a plug for our new annotation system, Polar. And I hate people who always have yet a new annotation system. <laughs> but, um, and I'm an engineer, so if it, and I was one of the original people around at Toby, and if it doesn't work, I don't want to use it. Toby, I don't think works. And, and for a variety of reasons. Oh, that doesn't mean anything, for a variety of reasons. Um, which is that there are things we want to label that are much closer to phonetics. And we don't necessarily know what the phonological categories definitely are. And when we go to different dialects and different languages, possibly even more so, but I would say probably just as much. So what our group, Steph Byron and I, have been doing is we sort of abandoned it. We label essentially what RPT would label, accents and boundaries. And then we look at things that look like intonational movements around them and label those. And we also, if we can tell what the pitch range is, we put that in. So in other words, things we think might be important, and we're not committed to they are important, but we feel like if we don't capture the phonetics, we'll never ever be able to match phonetics to a thing that might have to do with a function in the linguistic structure. So we really backed up a lot and sort of, we call it phonologically informed phonetic labeling. And we like it. And it, the other thing is we're not really like these are the only things. I think having duration cues and others could be other tiers that we could then, this is my part as an engineer, throw into a massive data mining scheme and find out stuff. Okay, so well, we'll just to make a plug and come to our poster tomorrow night. We'll okay, okay. <laughs> thanks, I, I, thanks for agreeing to be the engineer who puts everything into a. <laughs> can you send the link to the. Can you send the link so that we have it to, to po yes. Polar? Polar? I, in fact, I was trying to get on there, but I don't. Well, and you'll be putting it on the on our OSF page. We have a QR link. Oh. Component, but I'll, okay. I'll put our links up there, and I'll have some handouts because I'm a pretty stark guy. Thank you. Right, so it does sound like there's there's several movements to to come down a level from Toby, right? Which which we need to do if we want to then derive what what the categories are that we should be working on, whether it's whether it's something like the interna international prosodic alphabet or something like polar or something like looking at more Q-based analyses. Um, well, will you also have something on a Q-based thing tomorrow? Uh, no, <laughs> but uh, um, so the, the, there was a speech prosody presentation that was about uh, it, that was Q-based annotation of boundaries. So, and I think that what Byron, Stephanie, and Nanette are looking at is more um, Q-based intonation. intonation patterns. But only because we haven't gotten you on to our in <laughs> our system yet. <laughs> I, I would just like to add that not everyone in this working group is backing off as far as everyone else in the working group. <laughs> 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 and so I would say these are these are all methods that can be used together. Together, right. exactly. So and, and just sort of on a tangent with with Toby because I, there is I think still a lot of value in using those. Uh, Toby as a description of patterns that we see, you know, within and across languages. Um, one issue that came up a number of times in the workshop was the pipeline problem. That is, so it, it's at many different levels. So, so students who might want to study African American English prosody are there. There are a number of um, obstacles, and and one area that I think that uh, that those of us who work on Toby can do is to have some of the examples be more accessible to dialect variation. Yeah. So we have our Toby for mainstream American English with, that, with mainstream American English being only loosely defined and sort of by convenience, there are sort of limited numbers of speakers. But I think if we expand that to have more dialect variation, so just even for our canonical examples, um, so that we have more voices and more accents, for example, more dialects. So it's something to consider. And so I, I would really invite people to contribute their voices or their examples that they find useful so that we don't just have such a small number of canonical voices speaking those canonical examples. And I would argue that, to piggyback on that, that we can do that but the other kinds of annotation systems so that when people go to make a choice, mm -hmm. they will see that those are available and say, oh, I can go to that person. 
So that broadens the scope of what people have for, for choices of where to go to study what with whom. <laughs> but, but also on the, you know, which tool to use, of course, is dependent a lot on what are your questions. Mm -hmm. And so depending on, you know, what aspect you're interested in and perhaps maybe what sort of variability you're interested in, there might be, you know, different, different tools that are going to be useful for different questions. So. And also what stage of understanding you're at, probably. And so what? What stage of understanding? Ah, I don't want to make Christine talk more. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The question that I have, I, I wasn't uh, here Wednesday, but uh, how, how different it is, the intonation of uh, A, A, and, uh, I mean, how you have described, uh, you know, like a set of handful of uh, intonations or something that could be different, or, because for example, to start with the discourse completion task for Catalan, that was the start of uh, how we constructed constructed it for uh, then the other languages. What we did was uh, try to think of what, what Pierre Humbert did for her thesis, right? To think all the intonational uh, variation that you find in your variety and then try to see which context would elicit this, right? So that's, uh, but then how much difference do you expect? Because the intonational language has been studied quite a bit already, so. Mainstream. Uh, mainstream, yes, mm -hmm. sorry. Right, so, so we're, we're, that is work to be done. So um, I'll get to sort of what our next action steps are and we're very excited to use your, um, what, you all, what you just described as sort of an a, um, inspiration for what we might, what we might do. Um, but I think there's still discussion that we would have about what, what, what form might this discourse completion task take. Um, so, you know, this is a beginning. I think there's actually two things going on here, right? Which is that there are questions about what the shape of the thing is that we can get at with acoustic analysis. And if we're going to do comparisons between, you know, mainstream and whatever we're ima imagined AAE, as Lisa said earlier, that's one thing. But do, do we actually want something that looks like an AAL Toby? Like, do we want an AM model, international phonology, for AAL? The answer could be no. But I think sort of to um, Lena's point, like, to make things comparable, all of the studies that we know and sort of what you're saying on these initial findings, like, some of them are mine, some of them are Jason's, some of them are other people up here, yeah. right, Shalom? Um, we were uh, in some ways kind of limited being in the shadow of MAE Toby or using MAE Toby, so we don't know. Um, Shalom has proposed that maybe there's accentual phrases, right? right? Mm -hmm. But we, I didn't even look for that because people said, no, that doesn't happen in English. Mm -hmm. Well, if you saw Adam John's poster yesterday, it happens in Singaporean English. Mm -hmm. So why couldn't it be going on here? It's just that we've never tried to build a phonological system that works with these kinds of speakers. I mean, I guess to even piggyback on that, like for my MA th um, thesis, I think, so my MA thesis looked at intonation and um, AAL or AE, and I think I, you know, there's obviously something different, right? Like there is, and that's something that lots of researchers have commented on. It's anecdotal, like regular people will say, it's, oh, it's more sing-songy, or it's more, you hear this, like, this commentary about it, and, you know, I, actually tried to make an argument at one point that it was accentual phrased, you know, and like Nicole said, I was told, no, it's not. There's no way it can be. It's English. English isn't, that's not how English works. You can't do that. So I think some of the struggle for us, and at least for Nicole and I, it feels like sometimes that it's like you're trying to fit a, you know, square peg into a round hole. Like you've got this system that everyone says all English varieties have this kind of, this, this in inventory. So you're like, all right, I guess I'm going to use it. And I think that that for us was what was kind of hard. And there were, and I know um, some of Shalom's work has talked about this, you know, H star plus L. There's times where I felt like that that's what that was. And that was this pitch accent that I'm looking at, but I didn't call it that because it's not supposed to be in a variety of American English. And that, I think, was such a hard thing for me that I backed off, you know. You couldn't even use totally like labels. Right. You know? Jennifer Cole had some data that looked like there were twos. And when we say Toby, almost no one uses the break indices anymore. That's too much time. Um, <laughs> yeah, she did that. Were you talking about the 2005 paper that yeah. she did with Eric Thomas or whatever? Yeah, 
Yeah, I kind of, it never came out in print, but they gave me the manuscript that they wrote up and then yeah. just never published. It's and online. Um, oh, it is online. Yeah. Well, Eric was my MA advisor, so he gave it to me. And yeah, that was, I mean, that was kind of part of the impetus of maybe this is like accentual phrasing because there's a lot of this, or maybe it's a pitch accent <laughs> that's not prescribed for MA, but yeah. it became so intractable in terms of trying to argue what was going on that I just kind of stuck with what was, what was given. It's just to piggyback that, how is it different, right? So one, one issue is the categories and the, the um, number of phrases, but I feel like an issue that the whole adjacent can probably do and I probably do looking at Jewish English is the, the meaning of those categories, right? And particularly for drawing on the mainstream American English coding guidelines to say, oh, L plus H is used for contrastive focus. Um, Not an A. It's like, it's kind of like, okay, we're getting these more, I think, pitch accents, and there's differences in phonetic realization, too. So, again, if we're looking at the coding guidelines and say, here's what an L plus H star looks like, here's what it means. And then we're looking at these other varieties that are seeing differences in how these pitch accents are being used and how they're being phonetically realized. It's like, okay, we can sort of shove it into maybe, okay, maybe there is an H star and an L plus H star, but again, they might have different phonetic realizations. But uh, Shalom, didn't, didn't you say in your talk, for instance, that you, I forgot, you had a beautiful way of putting it, something, something about. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say that basically I let the data speak to me. Yeah. So I look, look, so the labels are there and there are these wonderful charts, but somebody's saying, well, the first thing I thought about, here is this thing and it means this. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It doesn't mean that for me. So I just said, okay, I'm using this label, but this is what my thing means. And I was careful in how I described what it meant. And I remember when Kathy and Drayton and I were looking at this, we basically just, okay, we want to be able to compare how I said, I know I sound like me, you sound like you, we sound different from each other. So we got the same <coughs> sets of data, right? And then we just looked to see which, which, which thing is prominent for you, which thing is prominent for me, how do you group yours, how do I group mine, and then we tried to figure out what those groupings and prominences meant. And then because we were both working within uh, the AM framework, we sort of just met several times and just duked it out. And then Iskra, Iskrover came along and said, what are you guys, how are you guys doing this? I'm trying to figure this thing out with Guadalupe and Creole. And so the three of us got together and we were working on this and that's basically how we worked it out. At the same time, she was, Iskra was faced with things that, well, this is Guadalupe and Creole, shouldn't you be comparing it to French, and which French variety do you compare it to, and all the literature on everything that's anything to do with French says, French has this, therefore, if you're looking at Guadeloupe and Cruel, it should have the same thing that French has. That's not what was happening. And so you, you, you're, you're faced with what's written, and one of the things about that is that you're faced with what's in the literature, and what is replicated and repeated often enough becomes truth, right? And so that's where we're faced with now in looking at this variety. We're faced with a truth that doesn't fit with the data. And so we have to shift that paradigm and, yeah. I think there's also a lesson from um, Emiliana Cruz's talk uh, yesterday, right, on, on the tones and she's, um, and I think there's this paper in language documentation conservation 2000 something, I, I'll put the link up later uh, with Tony Woodbury. And yeah, they had the same thing where like, yeah, for lexical tones too, sometimes there, there's lots of worries about how do we define these categories and then should I call this like, a, you know, yeah, I'm like, should I draw this as a symbol, um, you know, put this a number, I call this like a low, high, whatever. And they found, you know, really looking kind of like what you're saying, uh, at sort of looking at what things group together um, and, you know, also across communities and then um, seeing sort of what piles go together, what's same and different, and going on sort of, you know, what contrasts, and then looking at those and using those as definitional categories rather than worrying about what to call the categories and so forth was uh, very helpful. So I think yeah. there's a similar and experience. I should just say that working with Mary Beckman on this was fantastic. She's the kind of person who allowed, even within being a, a creator, co-creator of that kind of system, was still able to be flexible enough to say, I have no idea what's going on there, or why not try this? Why not try that? Why not try, try something else? So I guess the lesson there is that we need, while even while we're working within 
the confines of a system, we need not be completely constrained by it, but being allowing ourselves to be flexible. So there's kind of a double problem here, right? We want more people to do this kind of research. We want to bring in variationist sociolinguists. We want to bring in engineers. We want to bring in people that do music. That's great. They have no training in this. And the folks that have training, enough theoretical training in how intonation works cross-linguistically are not, are very limited, right? Like mostly in this room. Um, you can't, for, for you, Shalom, because you were trained by Mary Beckman, you had this sort of knowledge and freedom to, to be able to see, okay, this is an alternative explanation, this is another thing that I can try, and working in conjunction with her. For me, for example, when I was writing my dissertation, I was like, well, I'm not the one to propose new, a new inventory, <laughs> because I'm just learning to do this myself. Right? And so I, I have some trepidation about simultaneously trying to bring more people in into doing this kind of work without having a really good sort of theoretical understanding of what's going on. Like I'm, you know, people have said to me multiple times, so why don't you just create the AAD Toby? I'm like, I've been doing this for five minutes. Like I'm not the one. Um, which is why I'm so glad that we are doing this together, but I think that we need to do it carefully and not just for the reason you know the reasons that I've outlined but also because like remember that this is work on African-American English <laughs> when you're black you have to be twice as good to get half as much and when you work on black people's stuff it better be twice as solid Three to times. get half their respect. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so it's important that we do this well So that's one of the things I, I when we sent the, the slide around, I, I, we talked about comparison. Things. One of the things I thought about, and I put the comment here, is that how do we ensure that what we are comparing across AL varieties is the same thing? Yeah. So what is a variable, and <laughs> what are the possible variants? It's as basic as that, yep. right? So when we look at <coughs> Pittsburgh AL and we compare it with St. Louis AL, how do we know we're comparing the same things? And you know, setting up uh, a paradigm like you talked about with your group, if we're able to do something like that, even if, so if we collect the data within a, collecting a certain type, right? So if we, whatever that type is, sentence A, if we all collect sentence A, then we can work out what that thing that's the same or different between Pittsburgh and St. Louis without necessarily being wedded to a particular theory yet. But we really have to, fit, to be able to compare the same thing, or else we'll keep spinning, I think. Yep. And I think that's like been a big <clears throat> issue like over the last 10, 15 years within sociolinguistics in general. And some of this has to do with, and I guess I mentioned this on Wednesday, but like, you know, the study of AE has been really central to just the field of sociolinguistics since it kind of began, right? But, you know, I think Walt Wolfram has that 2007 paper where he problematizes this notion because so much of the original like work on AE was about showing that it's a systematic variety. It's not bad English. There's no such thing as bad English, you know, so on and so forth. And some of this was all about the you know difference versus deficit debate in the '60s and '70s, and in some cases into the '80s. And um, so because of that they there was this look there was always this look to find features that could be found everywhere because look check it out like see it, it, you find these everywhere but in the last 10 15 years and nicole and i have talked about this a lot over the last couple of years which is this notion that like well okay everybody pump the brakes and back up a second because like there is regional variation and you talk about st louis versus pittsburgh but like even in the state of north carolina mm -hmm. and a city like Raleigh, North Carolina, is only an hour and a half away from Robinson County. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you what, that is two very different varieties. So there's an urban and a rural variety. But are rural varieties the same? No. But are urban varieties? No. So there's this, like, I think there's a lot about AE in general that's unsettled. And I think that there's, and there's been a lot of work, and people are really, that's gaining a lot of steam. So I'm going to plug him because I love him to death. But Charlie Farrington, who's um, a colleague, or he's a, PhD candidate at U Oregon with me, and um, he's looking at like regional variation and like consonant, consonantal variation, which hasn't really been kind of looked at at all. And he's taking it from this like regional perspective and finding really crazy stuff that like I mean places even within the South like Memphis is very very different than Durham, and it's very very different than Atlanta, and and that's for a segmental 
things that are coming, you know, like so, and those are kind of well talked about, but so they're this still. Is, this is the thing that came up on Wednesday, and like to Shalom's point, I think doing this with really comparable data systematically is the way to go. We can't do region, age, gender, <laughs> sexuality, um, everything at the same time. Like that is third wave sociolinguistics, and it's beautiful, and I'm so glad that we do that now. And we think about identity, and I just gave a talk about affect and stance, right? I get it, I love it. But we are, you know, where the, the variation is sociolinguist that study AAE were in 1968. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where we are with understanding the prosody of this variety. So we might only be able to control for some of those things at this moment, sort of knowing the limitations of what we cannot do. But we can, you know, I see this with students a lot, like they get stuck because they're like, well, I didn't ask about their income. And I, mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, yes, they're, they, people vary. Right, in ways that we can't always measure. <laughs> but we're looking for what is likely to be systematic. So I, I totally agree with you on variation, but I also don't want us to get like totally stuck, like, ah, oh, but what about you? Because um, then, it, then it's hard to move, right? So I think that's later on. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so one of the things, right, and this is related to Pilar's point, we need to decide what are the what are the constructs, right? What might be the predictions? And so um, I was thankful, Lisa, for your talk of describing some of the constructions that we might be wanting to look into to see where the variability is. And um, I'm sure with that we can um, come up with others. So, so I think that's a that's a good place to start to say like what what kind of variation do we see in AAE with regard to syntactic structures, um, and then how might we then make predictions about what the prosodic structures would be based on that? Um, does anybody have any other thoughts on that? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. We all agree. Um, okay. Uh, so um, and yeah, and then we talked a lot that. about what the <laughs> challenges might be, right? And Nicole just oh, just. Right. Um, <laughs> talked about this, right, we know as working with, you know, the last ETAP, right, was on speaker variability, and we've seen a lot of that in this one as well, particularly around um, uh, sociological issues, and so so there are many things, and we're not going to be able to control everything, so there's going to be variation in geographic region, there's going to be variation based on effective stance, there's going to be variation depending on who you're talking to, um, identity, and then Lisa talked about the continuum, right, where people may be on a continuum in their dialect, and, and, and people may have multiple dialects that they can pull from, and so... So we have to think about what are the right elicitation procedures given so much variability and what types of variability are we actually going to try to control right at this point. Um, uh, we talked about how, how do we have to, and, and Shalom's talk was excellent in terms of how do we need to perhaps shift some of the elicitation techniques that we've used when we're looking at dialects that are not routinely written. Right, in the way that we want to capture. Um, and so I liked ideas about using picture tasks or, um, you know, and, and it was Christian, right, who had the question yesterday about, you know, how do you, how do you elicit given things when you can't just say to someone, here, read this sentence, or, um, and, then, and then given that we know that people speak differently depending on who their interlocutor is, who is eliciting the data? What's, what's the dyad where perhaps these, um, these productions are being produced? So, so we talked a lot about these challenges, um, which though I think, I think we've now seen that they apply in a lot of different contexts. Um, and so I think we can, we can deal with many of these questions and we just have to decide, you know, where are we gonna start from? What kinds of variability do we wanna take into account at the outset and what are we gonna what, are, what will we wait until we're in the 1990s of, <laughs> of the I have a question for Pilar, kind of here following on <clears throat> the other question I have. So I was, so I was wondering about <clears throat> in the context of AAE, thinking about um, we're in the whatever 1910s or <laughs> yeah, we're in the eight, about, 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, I you know I I I realize there's all these issues with you know having written things and Lisa talked about. You know, when when we were working on how the heck are you to elicit these bin sentences? Um, you know, if you're trying to control things, what do you do? And so, what uh, you were talking about when you have free response, and you know how valuable that is, and how there's been all these other studies on the sort of fixed sentences. So I guess one thing I was wondering is, so if you're in the whatever we're now the 17th century, <laughs> can it still be? You know, 
I mean, as a starting point, do you feel like those wow. can still be valuable, or are you scripting, saying? Scripting, you mean? What? You mean scripting? You know, yeah. I mean using. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess that if you know. Uh, very well, well, yeah. So I want to be able to value these things. Right. That, that that you're really confident that that that, that uh, the sentence is still accepted by the mm -hmm. community, right? And and you make sure of these beforehand, then, right? Okay. Yeah. Potential yeah. variation on you know getting some particles or another structure or whatever that might interfere. That's the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> but of course. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I was wondering. And, and then, after having this um, wonderfully vetted script, how do we get from script to elicitation from speakers who m might? It, not want to engage with a writing system that's not theirs, or that's not representing the variety that they use. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the scripting is really interfering also in their uh, identity by using <laughs> English script, uh, right? I mean, the, like you were saying this morning, right? It's like uh, uh, it's it's really changing the, the the perception, right? And then you, if you are in the continuum, right, you get more to, towards more standard, right? So it's probably another argument not to use so much scripting, right? Why, why would you try to use a scripting? Right? The same I, sentence all over. I think I interpreted her use of script as in a, t a, a, a piece of a text, however construed, oh, no. meaning I mean, that the uh, it's something. That's what you meant, right? Uh, I was talking something like the <coughs> examples that Lisa and I were, uh, she was showing, which, you know, our starting point. I don't know that that's what one would stay with. I mean, there's issues, but, um, but you know, it, it's, it relates to another point that came up again in the workshop that Megan and Tristan. <laughs> Hi, Megan and Tristan. Um, yeah, Tristan has this great prosody that Megan will give a talk about sometime. It's like, what, what count? Count prosody. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, but let me, on, on that notion, so, so my general view, of course, I mean, they have a, some elicited speech. Um, spontaneous speech, but in, in this project, so it's to, um, speakers hear a scenario and they're given one sentence and they're asked to produce the sentence. So I work with the community and I'm confident that the speakers know the variety. And so they're given a scenario and asked to use the uh, best rendition of that sentence that fits the scenario. So. It's true if they see be if some speakers who are somehow engaging in, you know, writing, if they do it a good a good bit, I guess the bin could, at first glance, throw them off because they might be expecting something else. But actually, the sentences, if you produce it with a, you know, in a kind of I guess for you a mainstream American English reading, I mean, it would just be hilarious. <laughs> it would just be hilarious. So what I'm really so I work with the community, and so my definition of African American English is extremely narrow. It's not everybody's definition. But when I'm talking about something, it's a particular system, and speakers know it. And so it's true. I mean, it, at mainstream American English, I'm sure, has had some effect. But it's not this magical thing that sort of and you know encompasses everybody that immediately makes you lose it and just oh you can't do anything in your own variety you're just really focusing on mainstream American English so I agree if speakers have some range on the continuum um, and and if they have some particular kinds of attitudes it's true that they're going to feel like perhaps they want to do something that's standard I think but I'm really trying to work with a community of speakers who know a particular variety and given a scenario, if I choose to use that, if they have to respond with a sentence, what they're trying not to do is sound strange. And if you give a rendition that you know, isn't in line with that particular scenario, even if you see something that's written in books, I guess, you, know, you, you, you just wouldn't want to give something that sounds strange. So yeah, so I think in some instances, 
that could work for some for some um, communities. I wouldn't want to give them. I, I've never done any reading tasks, you know, to ask people to read. That's something I would never want to do. But to really, if there is something about a particular meaning, if there's a meaning that really matches a particular uh, scenario, then I think I want to find ways to get those particular meanings. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess my question would be sort of connected to Philip's talk this morning. He's great about you know getting away from written paradigms. Um, is the question of how messy this project is willing to let Dave get, right? So I would I would wonder if you can actually do your elicitation without those printed sentences. I mean, potentially with an intermediate, like, oh, you try to say a sentence using the word did and see what happens. Because I know, like, you get a lot of variability with the DCP responses, but eventually, if you get enough that are comparable under the structure you're looking for, that, okay, we got some people who didn't use the exact construction that we were aiming for with the elicitation, but there was going to be enough that you could sort of back off the run, but I don't sort of have a sense of how much, if you took away the sentence, how many, how many constructions. You can you clearly elicit Ben. You can simply say, oh my goodness, did you just get those shoes? I've been having them. But what more can you get beyond that? So yeah. I think my um, understanding is that you certainly can get these structures in free speech. You can get Ben or in a lot of places, but limited now. ones. Yeah. yeah, but you're not going to get you know the range There's I think that yeah. you'd like to have. I think yeah. there's so. a thing sort of both of these. Um, you know, we can prime people, yeah. and we can measure, we can administer DDMs, and we can see what fe what syntactic, more syntactic features they actually have, not with and DDM. whether this would be well, not exactly. <laughs> not with DDM. Like, well, no, but you know what I mean, like <laughs> not not in the way that clinicians use it, but like in the way that Yannicka and Walt use it, right? Um, to see like are these features that this speaker would ever have in any type of situation, right? Even just grammaticality judgments mm -hmm. from these speakers, mm -hmm. and then see if we can get them to produce them. Because they will tell you if, you know, complete of done is ungrammatical for them, right? No, no, I wouldn't say this. No one I know would ever say this um, as a way to get out the, at that. But I was thinking, um, Lisa, what you're saying about the community is really interesting because my speakers are all middle class and college educated. So getting them to read is not, is not a problem, but getting them to say these things, these stigmatized morphosyntactic features, is a problem. So they will, if you, if you have them do that kind of task without the prompt sentence, they will always do it in MAE because they're, they're domains in which they are, are sort of cognitively like primed to use these are so severely limited that it's hard to get them to do it in a lab. And so for the purposes of what it is that we're trying to do, maybe we need speakers who are not, you know, university psychology pool <laughs> students or people like, like your work with children, right? Children know the domains in which they use each variety, but might not have the same sort of feelings around completing this kind of task that, you know, middle class college students would. But middle class speakers, I would, if they know something even about this variety, I mean, even if they're middle class, and if you give them the scenario, and if you give them the sentence, I mean, at least I would hope they would say, oh, I wouldn't really say this, you know, in, within, in a crowd, but this is really how it goes. Otherwise, it would just be gibberish. Yeah, so it would just <laughs> but be I think gibberish. you have to give them the sentence, because if you allow them to complete it, yes. they'll complete it in, ma in mainstream, right? So I think then it's what what this is this is all speaking to is we would like to use a variety of elicitation techniques so that we can get a continuum right we talked about sort of this continuum between very controlled lab speech yeah, where nice. yeah. where right you but have hey, what paper filled something oh um, yeah 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 Ben Rollin um Right, where you get you get highly controlled, easy to analyze, consistent across all of your speakers, it's but consistent. then you know, do you know that that's ecologically valid? Whereas on the other hand, you have 
you know, completely free, spontaneous productions, and you don't have any control of what you're, over what they're saying. And so we're, we're going to try to come up with a method where we can perhaps sample from across that distribution. Yeah, and I'm going to plug um, another University of Oregon project. So um, <laughs> <clears throat> Tyler Kendall and a bunch of us in his lab have been building this corpus of regional African-American language. Um, <coughs> it's the first publicly available corpus of African-American language. It does get at some of the region stuff, so the core component is um, half of it's Ralph Fazold's um, landmark like 1972 study. The other part of it is these um, recordings that have been done over the last few years. Um, the update's coming, if, like next week or this week potentially. Um, and Tyler built a like web-based like interface to it. And so something like Ben and, so, and things like Habitual B because um, it's always been kind of talked about, at least within sociolinguists, like, right, it's not really good and it's not, like, terribly valid to be like, oh, well, I'm going to, this person's has, you know, 450 habitual bees and this other person only has 20. It was like, well, were they talking about something habitual or not? Like, because <laughs> if they aren't, then they're not going to use it. They could be a categorical user, but if you're not going to, if they're not talking about something habitual or something like remote time or anterior at the best, they're not going to use the construction. So this web-based interface that we, if, you know, um, that Tyler's built has like searchable terms that you can use like regular expressions and get out like those constructions. So then you actually do see them in the, in the wild by a per item basis. And so, or by a per like instance basis. And so then that could kind of help complement some of the elicitation tasks um, that you would be interested in. And um, Charlie and I used the Frank Porter Graham stuff of, God, way longer than that, four or five years ago, um, where we looked at, um, it's so Walt Wolfram had this like um, longitudinal study that he had done um, of, and the data's, because they're, they for two to 20 or something, um, a lot of it's locked and you can't use it, but I worked on it so I get a hold of it. But we use that, we use corpus-based methods, this is prior to Coral, but we use methods and we got quite a lot of we're, you know, we're remote time bands, we got a whole lot of habitual bees, and we were able to kind of look at um, the kind of the interface of syntax and sound. Um, and that was a smaller data set than what Coral is by far. And so it's, I think, <coughs> kind of unifying like corpus-based approaches with kind of, you know, phonetic, phonological approaches can help um, get at some of these questions. So not having a whole lot of knowledge of what's in there, how, What's the level of the recording? So right the modern now, recordings are really, really good. They're yeah. really, really good. So the ones that I heard from the slab were very good. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but that, that's. I'm assuming some of the older ones are mm -hmm. not yeah. as. So some of like the Ralph's legacy data is you know it, yeah. they record in '68. So right. um, we did a lot trying to make sure that we had ones and you know they were sampled at the same rate and we. We did a lot to make sure that they were, we didn't use all of them, we used the ones that we thought were the best. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so those aren't maybe necessarily as good as, but the modern recordings were done like last year. And, um, it, and the really good thing that we try to control for, so this question of how speakers might behave depending upon the race ethnicity um, of the experimenter, they were, all the modern recordings were done by a community member, uh, an African American woman that knew them for the most part. And so they were comfortable with her, um, they knew her, um, they had a history with her. And so you kind of can kind of get at, get a, you know, control for some of that yeah. kind of effect. Yeah. Um, so sort of where we, where we arrived is we would like to do some corpus development. Um, and we're sort of inspired by these uh, open source, high replicability studies like many babies, if you are familiar with that, where just trying to use the same task and the same protocols across different labs for the purposes of generating a lot of data <coughs> that is similar on many dimensions, but then differs, for example, by geographic region or you know whatever else we, we decide. Um, and, and so then it's just a matter of deciding what the materials in the task will be. Ha ha ha, that's all. <laughs> so you can, yeah. Yeah. That's super
speak in the kinds of discourse contexts that we already know about. Which makes us out of categories and private categories. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so, yeah. This is kind of where we where we stopped. So we'll need to talk more. But um, I think there's there's some energy around building something where we can we can decide on what the materials and the protocols are, and then we can implement them. Like, fortunately, we already represent a, a some nice variability in in geography, um, and then you all are welcome to get on board um, as well. And then the hope is. You know, we can pool our resources, and then we can, and then you know, we can have um, data that kind of are this continuum between highly controlled, right? You know, set up a, a scenario and give people an explicit sentence, all the way to these more free speech, and perhaps using some of the the corpora that are already available, and then and then also using our various expertise with different um, analysis um, techniques, and then. You know, we would, it would allow us to have a lot of data, um, which and we can pool our resources to do some analysis of that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, do you plan to record any control data? I, I, like, say you, you were saying uh, we're going to record communities in St. Louis, in Boston. What about if you find features that are specific to these communities and people say, well, but this is a regional variation. That's a great question. going to show, I don't know if there's comparable data that you can control yeah, like somehow. So, um, uh, Lisa and uh, the other Lisa Seltzer did a little bit of this where in the Lake Arthur community that um, uh, this Lisa works in, uh, they, yeah, well, can you know a little bit more about rates? So you, so, but they basically had the same task which included like map tasks and uh, other discourse things, but they had community people who I guess. Yes. Yeah. Right. So we had a, a community yeah. person sort of facilitate the conversation among members in the community. Yeah. So we had map tasks and some other kinds of tasks that are used. But so then they were, uh, yeah. So they were in the Lake Arthur community, but some were AAE speakers, and the others were like some. Yeah, some were. Uh, yeah, exactly. AAE. So we had, um, I don't know what you want to call it in Southwest Louisiana, but some were <laughs> AAE speakers, and others were non AAE speakers. So this is a you can say well, some were African Americans, and the others were non. And so that alone, at least for this community, is enough to separate them with respect to language. And so they were talking two together. So, um, you know, we saw some pretty nice things there. Yeah. Right, but it's a good point, sort of mm -hmm. compared to what. And yeah. um, I don't know how comfortable we all feel saying, well, we'll just get the local EAE dialect and we'll say, here's our matched pair. Um, but I think I think there's probably value in understanding then what to, to assess what it, what are the what's the range of regional variation apart from the dialectical variation. I kind of want to say this too, though, because like, you know, it's twice as much work. <laughs> Nobody has a problem when you're studying regional variation and all your people are white. Mm -hmm. So why do we have to study white people? <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. Well, in the South, we definitely need to be able to say something about that, because there definitely have been claims that, you know, this is just Southern English. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. this is, and so there's, con there's some overlap, but yeah. Um, there's, well, there's also there is also that yeah. in California yeah. um, with black speakers. So like, I see I see the point of it, but the regional variation for white speakers is much more well described. Not in prosody, but like, why don't wh like we don't have to do everything at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I I want this to be a totally. thing that's accomplishable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we can we can <clears throat> also collect information from the, the local white speakers and all of that kind of thing, but I don't I don't necessarily know that we need like paired data, right, um, as, as such. And then like, of course, we're, if we're trying to def, to build a, a DCT that taps into specific structures that we would get in AAE, then sort of like, what are you comparing it to, right? Like, like Lisa's so saying, people cool. would look at that and say, I can't say these words in my dialect, so. Right, and sorry. The, 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 the features that a particular uh, set of speakers have, they are AL speakers, they have it. By, by saying it, that these features belong or are associated with those speakers, it doesn't mean nobody else 
should have mm -hmm. that. So if later on we get that kind of data, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. The, the people who I recorded for my mm -hmm. rural Jamaican people in that community, mm -hmm. maybe the people in the next community have those features, but that's them when I get to them. Mm -hmm. if I <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can live with that. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so thank you, everybody, um, for putting effort into this and the work that went into um, preparation. And um, we're excited to continue. And so, again, if you if you have comments, ideas, please get on the um, mailing list. And when we come knocking, to, yeah, sure you <laughs> All right, thank you very I much. I want to say one last thing, and that is, um, this is such a big job. <laughs> And, I think that, you know, and you would like to help. So rich, <laughs> but I think you should bear in mind that you're going to start. Yeah. You're probably not going to finish. <laughs> and so don't let that haunt you. It's like every project I've ever done. Right. <laughs> 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 so with me. <laughs> the other thing I would like to say is that um, I am just fascinated by this richness of variety that we've heard about in this set of dialects, in this work, in this meeting. And what I think might be about to happen is that we are going to learn from this project that we better start looking at this in a lot more languages and dialects. Mm -hmm. So go to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.